More than 1-200 kilometers of massive steel pipelines lie silently on the floor of the Baltic Sea, yet they are powerful enough to reshape Europe's entire energy map. Beginning in 2011, Gazprom launched Nord Stream 2, a system of two parallel pipelines designed to connect St. Petersburg directly to Germany's northern coast, bypassing all transit countries in between. From the very first blueprints, the project sparked fierce controversy. From climate concerns to complex geopolitical calculations tied to Europe's energy security. Despite that pressure, construction moved forward offshore in cold, deep, and high-risk conditions. So what forced humans to place thousands of kilometers of steel pipes in an environment that allows no room for error? The answer lies beneath the Baltic Sea. Despite intense environmental controversy, mega-scale gas pipeline projects continue to move forward because of their strategic role in energy security. Nord Stream 2 alone carried an estimated construction cost of over 11 billion, stretching across multiple years and involving thousands of workers and large offshore construction vessels. But that scale comes with serious environmental risks. Even a minor failure on the seabed can trigger methane leaks, a greenhouse gas far more heat-trapping than CO2 in conditions where rapid intervention is nearly impossible. This risk became reality in July 2021 in the Gulf of Mexico, when a subsea gas pipeline operated by Pemex ruptured, forcing gas to the surface and igniting into massive flames that burned for hours, creating images widely described as an eye of fire in the ocean. The incident revealed a harsh reality. Beneath the sea, Every technical error can escalate instantly into a disaster beyond human control. Before Nord Stream 2 could become an offshore construction project, it existed first as a complex planning challenge that stretched on for many years. The objective was to create a direct connection between Russia's massive gas fields and Europe's major energy markets. However, the shortest line on a map was not necessarily the most feasible route on the seabed. Spanning roughly 130 kilometers, the proposed pipeline would pass through the territorial waters or exclusive economic zones of five different countries, each with its own environmental regulations, technical standards, and strategic interests tied to the Baltic Sea. From the earliest stages, the marine environment became a central factor shaping the entire planning process. The Baltic Sea is a semi-enclosed body of water with limited natural self-cleansing capacity and a long history of pollution from industrial activity, shipping, and coastal cities. Even minor disturbances to the seabed can re-suspend contaminated sediments or disrupt sensitive ecosystems. For this reason, every country along the route required detailed environmental impact assessments before granting construction permits. To meet these requirements, survey teams carried out high-resolution mapping of the seafloor. Multi-beam sonar systems, seismic instruments, and unmanned underwater vehicles were used to analyze seabed topography, sediment layers, and potential risk zones. One unique challenge in the Baltic Sea is the presence of unexploded munitions left behind from World War I and World War II, scattered across the seafloor for decades. Whenever possible, the pipeline route was adjusted to avoid these hazards. In areas where avoidance was not feasible, the unexploded ordnance had to be neutralized through controlled detonations. To reduce the impact of underwater shock waves, contractors deployed bubble curtains around the blast sites, helping absorb acoustic energy and protect marine life. Only after the route was finalized, environmental risks were brought under control, and the legal requirements of each country were satisfied could Nord Stream 2 move into the construction phase. In many ways, this planning stage became the foundation that determined the success or failure of the entire project. The first phase formed the foundation of the entire project and focused on the production of more than 200,000 steel pipe sections, each manufactured to extremely strict precision and quality standards. This was a massive logistical challenge requiring large-scale industrial production capacity and rigorous quality control. The pipe sections were made from high-strength steel plates, specifically engineered to withstand operating pressure and the harsh marine environment. Each section had an outer diameter of approximately 1,150 millimeters and a length of up to 2 meters. The manufacturing process began by forming the steel plates into cylindrical shapes, followed by longitudinal seam welding. 
Hydraulic expansion was then applied to achieve precise dimensions and roundness, and the pipe ends were beveled to prepare them for field welding during installation. To meet the project's total material demand, three large pipe manufacturing plants were mobilized. These facilities operated continuously, maintaining an average production rate of nearly 100 pipe sections per day. Every single pipe section had to undergo a comprehensive quality inspection process, including non-destructive testing of weld seams to ensure the pipe's structural integrity. The application of protective coatings was mandatory to ensure long-term performance and operational lifespan. During pipe fabrication, multiple protective layers were applied to optimize flow efficiency and preserve structural integrity over time. Specifically, a low-friction epoxy coating was applied to the internal surface of the pipe. This internal lining significantly reduced surface friction, thereby minimizing pressure losses along the extremely long pipeline, an essential factor in maintaining maximum gas transmission efficiency. At the same time, a specialized external polymer or epoxy anti-corrosion coating was applied to the outer steel surface. This layer served as the primary protective barrier against electrochemical and chemical corrosion caused by the highly aggressive seawater environment of the Baltic Sea. Together, these protective coatings played a critical role in extending the pipeline's operational life and ensuring reliable performance under harsh offshore conditions. After fabrication and concrete weight coating were completed, the steel pipe sections entered the transportation stage to coastal ports. This was a critical logistical phase, requiring precise coordination between manufacturing plants, storage yards, and port infrastructure. Each pipe section, weighing several tens of tons, was loaded onto specialized transport vehicles or inland vessels and moved to coastal transshipment ports in Finland and Germany. At the ports, the pipes were staged in large storage yards and arranged according to the planned installation sequence to optimize material flow. Heavy-duty cranes and handling systems were used to load, unload, and position the pipes safely, minimizing mechanical impact and the risk of damage. From these port facilities, the pipe sections were gradually transferred onto supply vessels or directly onto offshore pipeline ships, following carefully planned schedules that ensured a steady and uninterrupted supply of materials to ongoing offshore operations in the Baltic Sea. On the specialized pipeline vessels operating in the Baltic Sea, the entire deck is organized as a closed-loop industrial production line, where each installation step is carried out continuously in the middle of the ocean. The process begins when two pipe sections, each weighing up to approximately 24 tons, are positioned for welding and precisely aligned. Automated welding systems then complete the circumferential weld around the pipe, after which specialized inspection equipment immediately scans the entire weld to detect any structural defects or leaks. Only joints that meet all technical standards are allowed to proceed further along the line. Next, the welded joint is sealed with a dedicated protective system, combining heat shrink sleeves and elastic filler materials to prevent corrosion, while providing the flexibility needed for the pipeline to adapt to uneven seabed terrain. As the vessel slowly advances along the predefined route, the connected pipe sections are continuously guided into the water and gradually lowered into their designed position. Through tight coordination between transportation, installation, and positioning systems, this method enables the installation of up to three kilometers of pipeline per day, a pace rarely achieved in offshore construction. The pipeline installation process had to address geological and marine environmental challenges through seabed preparation and the management of crossings. While in many areas the seabed was smooth enough to keep the pipeline stable with minimal intervention, this condition did not apply along the entire route. In sections with uneven or rough seabed terrain, specialized vessels were deployed ahead of pipe installation to level depressions using rock and gravel, creating a flat and stable foundation for the pipeline to rest on. By contrast, in shallow water areas where pipelines are exposed to strong wave action and hydrodynamic currents, the pipes could not be laid directly on the seabed. Instead, they were placed inside pre-excavated trenches which were later backfilled to secure the pipeline in position. In addition to natural seabed conditions, the Nord Stream 2 route intersected with other existing subsea infrastructure. At locations where the pipeline crossed underwater power cables, telecommunications cables, or other pipelines, rock berms were installed to protect each utility at these crossing points. 
These protective measures ensured the structural integrity and long-term reliability of both systems sharing the seabed. Deep oceans are among the harshest environments humans have ever entered. Pressure rises rapidly with depth, salt water constantly corrodes metal, and ocean storms can destroy structures weighing tens of thousands of tons. Yet beneath these hostile waters, enormous oil reserves have been discovered, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico and offshore Brazil. To reach oil trapped thousands of meters below the surface, engineers were forced to create one of the most complex structures ever built, the offshore oil drilling platform. Unlike onshore extraction, offshore drilling is not only a challenge of depth, but a direct confrontation with the sea itself. A modern drilling platform can rise hundreds of meters above the waterline and weigh more than 50,000 tons, engineered to withstand hurricanes and waves exceeding 30 meters in height. Long before such a structure appears on the ocean surface, preparation begins years in advance, starting with extensive geological surveys. Engineers use sonar systems and remotely operated vehicles to analyze the seafloor and identify rock layers capable of supporting massive loads. In shallow waters, enormous steel piles are driven deep into the seabed and locked in place with high-strength concrete, forming the foundation for fixed platforms. In deeper waters, however, platforms do not rest on the seafloor. Instead, floating structures such as semi-submersibles or spar platforms are employed, stabilized by mooring lines stretching hundreds of meters down to massive concrete anchors. Once the platform is towed into its operating position, the real work begins. A continuous drill string must pass through the water column, where pressure increases relentlessly with depth, then continue several kilometers into the earth to reach the oil reservoir. Directional drilling technology allows the drill bit to curve precisely, extending reach and accessing oil pockets scattered beneath the seabed. To function without interruption, each offshore platform operates like a small city. Control rooms, living quarters, medical facilities, power plants, water treatment systems, and oil and gas processing units must all function together in a confined space. A large platform can produce tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil per day, generating enormous economic value. Yet the ocean also carries severe risk. From the Piper Alpha disaster to the Deepwater Horizon spill, history has shown that a single offshore failure can cause environmental damage lasting decades. Despite the danger, humanity continues to return to the open sea because beneath the dark waters lies an energy resource capable of shaping the global economy. That enduring pursuit continues to redefine engineering limits, risk tolerance, and ambition. Then the desert is the battlefield where they confront an invisible enemy, heat, wind, and absolute emptiness. Harvesting energy in a sea of sand was once considered impossible. But when massive reservoirs of natural gas were discovered beneath the deserts of the Middle East, the Sahara, and the Basin and Range province in the United States, a new chapter of engineering began. One defined by drilling rigs standing alone in places where even life struggles to exist. Ground temperatures in many deserts can climb to 70 degrees Celsius, hot enough to warp steel over time. Humidity hovers near zero, causing metal to oxidize at a brutal rate. While sandstorms with winds reaching 90 Keber Yokoros H carve equipment as if with millions of invisible blades. Yet in conditions that seem designed to erase every trace of human presence, drilling rigs weighing hundreds of tons rise like steel towers, defying nature itself. The construction journey begins with stabilizing the foundation, the hardest problem on shifting sand. Engineers must drill down to the bedrock, sometimes as deep as 80 meters, then drive heavy steel piles and inject cement grouting to prevent the desert from slowly swallowing the structure. Next comes a transport of hundreds of massive steel components across trackless terrain, where each convoy may spend hours covering only a few dozen kilometers. Once the drilling tower is raised, the next challenge is advanced horizontal and deep drilling technology. Major gas fields such as Gowar and South Pars lie roughly 5,500 meters underground. Drill pipes must be forged from Kiarmo alloy or N80 steel to withstand immense pressure and prevent cracking, while a special polymer coating protects them against corrosive H2S gas, a toxic compound commonly found in desert reservoirs. To operate a drilling site in the middle of nowhere, workers must build an entire miniature ecosystem, heat-resistant living quarters, 
air filtration systems, and independent power generators. A typical desert drilling rig consumes one to two mendowas of electricity, roughly the same as a small residential neighborhood. But the greatest danger is neither heat nor sandstorms. It is the instability of the underground formations. Many regions contain high-pressure gas pockets, where even a small miscalculation can trigger a catastrophic blowout. One such event occurred at the Hasi Mesaud oil field in 1980 when a jet of fire more than 120 meters tall burned uncontrollably for days. Even so, the desert remains one of humanity's richest energy frontiers. The Middle East alone holds over 40% of the world's natural gas reserves, generating hundreds of billions of dollars for the global economy each year. Beneath the cold, high-pressure darkness of the seafloor, building subsea gas pipelines is more than an infrastructure project. It represents the true limits of modern engineering, from geological surveys and pipe manufacturing to transportation, installation, and marine environmental protection. Every stage demands near-absolute precision. A single small mistake can lead to consequences that last for decades. Yet despite the risks, humanity continues to push into the ocean depths to keep the energy lifelines of the modern world flowing. If you enjoy stories like this, don't forget to like the video and follow the Mandarin Tech channel.